Oh. All right, I'm gonna pretend that I'm awake. It's strange because sometimes when I get into a series of bows like this and painting them, I wind up having like these weird, vivid, nightmare-like dreams. Not really nightmares, but just a weird, weird thing. So I was basically not sleeping while I was sleeping last night. But I, I have a number of viewers that watch my, my modest channel that are interested in, in getting into painting bows. And just like rawhide backing, just do it. It's not mysterious, just follow the steps. In sinew backing, simpler than you would think, you can do it. Paint, just, just, just do it. Um, before I, I begin to go through my kit, my, I, my, um, my stuff that I use to paint, including templates that I save, I'm going to say that if you paint on a rawhide ball and you have a shaky hand or a cat bumps you and you go off course, you can, you can actually um, erase everything you've done. So it's, it's not a one-way, I'm totally committed kind of a trip on these things. Rawhide is this great material that allows you to paint on it with acrylic latex paints, uh, and I'll show you those. And, and if you don't like it, just take a paper towel, a scrubby paper towel, and get it wet, and you can just scrub it off. Wait for it to dry and just remove it. So it is definitely not, say, uh, something that you have to commit 100% to. All right, and so there is always the discussion, and I get it occasionally, people look at what I do, I'm gonna grab this one, the Talawa inspired ball. And and they say that the, the purity of a ball is is sullied, it is tarnished if you paint it. And I would have to say that the, aside, along with the West Coast, um, whether it's Yurak or Hoopa or Talawa or, or Modak, there was a great variety of painting that went on with bows in North America. And it, it, it goes into the northern plains with the indoor adornments. Um, beautiful um, quilled, say, middle limb wraps, some painting, design. It, it was just what people did. You had this amazing tool, this amazing companion. It's much more than a tool. Um, and in fact, I forget which tribe it is. I've got so much stuff floating around in here. They, I think it's Lakota. They don't call this a bow or a tool or a weapon, it's called a blessing. And that's what they thought of these devices, these, these blessings. The importance um, to their livelihood, to their very being, their connection. And so it is, it is very, very viable. It's a, not a bad thing to paint your bows. Make them your own. Okay, so let's see, where shall I start? How about basic design? Now with my paddle bows, you can see I have the possibility of a wide range of designs. And not one is any better than the other. And I'm referring to the simplicity. If you were to look at, at this ball, you'd say, wow, the detail, including the black stripe along here with like a thousand dots. That's amazing, but if you contrast it with say this one, there are just four diamonds on it, black diamonds, and then outlined with, with copper. You know, I would say both of them are equally powerful. So you don't need to go overboard, you don't have to have the most wild, wild paint scheme um, to, to add power to your bows. I really like this one. And again, I can get away with a lot on a paddle bow because they are wide, they are wide. Now you're saying, I do narrow long bows, what can I do? Well, a while ago, I think it was last winter, or the winter before, I sold Anthony, hey Anthony, not Anthony that just bought a bow, but the other Anthony. I made an elm bow. It was more of an eastern woodland style bow. And uh, recurved tips, beautiful bow. The thing just put the air, you didn't even need to aim it, the arrows were where you wanted it to. It had kind of a scallop thing. And look at that, tricky me. I save all my templates. And it was simply taking the side of the bow and a pencil and being careful that you don't shift it around on both sides. And then there were circles inside each one of these things. And so 
That is the key here, templates. I'm going to start at the beginning. I'm going to start at the beginning of this talala bowl. Um, you're all intelligent beings, so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about without me saying you have to have a certain kind of cardboard. Let's just take this bad boy. The first step is always I lay it on the ground and I work on the ground and I put cardboard and sometimes I have to like glue strips together to get the proper length and just cut it out or trace it and then cut it out so I've got this kind of a sketch pad. And this is not the finished version of this. And you can see there's lines over lines. And in fact, if you're keen of eye, you'll notice that that arrowhead down here is missing. Well, that arrowhead was the perfect shaped arrowhead. So I wound up using it right there. I like that shape. You have to find the right shape and you don't have to do it all in one cut. As you see here, these are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five pieces that I had to like stick together to get the pattern that I like that had the right proportions that fits on the bow. Now a little added thing, if I look at this one right here, sometimes I don't remember um, the placement on the limb, eight inches. Look at that if you don't believe me, I've got an eight written on there. And so I just measure from the Fit around eight inches, trace it there, flip it over, and trace that one. Uh -huh, tricky. Now, just if you're interested, and maybe if you're not, the Talawa bowl that will go in my my files. Eastern woodland and taken out of the the traditional Boyer's Bibles. And you can probably guess what this complicated bunches. That's uh, bits and pieces of my raven bows. And I've got two versions of raven bows. So they are both represented there. I know I'm ending the mystery. You probably thought that I just drew all these things freehanded. Let's sort through our pile. Oh, this stuff is cool. It's that cloth snakeskin backing. That's going to go on my, my snaky bow number four. I've got four things I'm going to do in this run. Take that out. Oh, let's see here. And I just, I get the, the proportions right on this. This is for those triangles right there. This is for this. And the nice thing is that, suppose that I have a different length of this and the different length of this, and it doesn't match up right, I can, I can stretch it. I can move it a little bit. And then even so, if I have to take extra pencil lines, and it's like I've got four pencil lines and they're all over the place on here, remember which ones I'm painting to. And then when I'm done painting, I can take a sponge with soapy water and just gently without washing the paint off, I can wash pencil lines off. In some cases, I may go so far as like on that last raven boy I made with white. Um, I left the pencil line borders on it because it helped pop the white. So you don't necessarily have to get rid of the pencil lines. It's all art. So I've got this. Oh, these are nice. See, if I was to back these bows with uh, tight bond, tight bond two, tight bond three, whatever, I'd prefer tight bond two over tight bond three just because if tight bond three, if the, the sizing dries, it's not going to get wet again and so you're not going to get a good enough bond but with high glue actual fill made um deer raw high glue after i get done wrap it and high glue is nice too because it starts sticking sooner earlier than tight bond would and so you, you can wrap it a little tighter without risking um the rawhide slipping i really like high glue and if i fail to impress you how you prepare the rawhide if you're going to glue it down with high, with high glue. Soak it, not in plain water, soak it in a weak glue sol solution so you know, you know for a fact that glue has penetrated that rawhide and it's not going to come up again instead of just having a surface bond. What else do we have? 
See, I save everything. There's the turtle. That's bear paw. Oh. That's the thunderbird. I've got everything in here. This is cool. And a wide variety of, let's see, what do we have here? That's another one. Another gauge for that. I've got two different styles and a whole bunch of diamonds. And if you look at them, they have the distances marked out 22 and 5 eighths, um, 15 and 3 quarters. And so I've got the whole wide range of things. Save, save your templates. I had a fellow that saw, I had this cool bear paw bow. And I don't, I, my computer died, I have phones that died. And so I don't have photos of all my bows. And so he's like, I saw this one that you had out four years ago with a bear paw on it, or a wolf paw, name your paw. And he wanted to buy it for his son-in-law, along with a set of arrows from Warpath Archery. Beautiful arrows that match the bow. And he's a big hunter. <clears throat> you walk into his house, it's like Keith's house, you know. <laughs> Deer heads, antlers everywhere. Um, and I saw him at the Points North, it's a gas station, a couple days ago. And he's like, hey, you know that bow that you sold me for my son-in-law? I go, yeah. Did he get a deer with it? And he goes, no, nah, he doesn't even want to use it. It's so nice. He has it like... Like, right when you walk into the entryway, the bow and all the arrows there. If you buy one of my bows, use it. Use it. They can certainly be decorative, but they were made for more than being decorative. Okay, so the scheme, the scheme of painting, getting your design, this little doohickey, developing a simple set of patterns. Um, you'd use a pencil. I got a pencil over there. You know what those things look like. You know what this looks like. It's like tired John drinking coffee. Nesca Nescafe Classico. The flavor of, of winners. <laughs> That's my head. <clears throat> okay, the paint itself. These things. You go to Hobby Lobby or any art store, these things are great. And you can water them down so they will look like actual natural pigments because yes, I do also work with natural pigments. Not every bow I make winds up, winds up on YouTube. Not every bow I sell is sold on YouTube. As a matter of fact, in the Nature Center, I have a sinew-backed bow. Beautiful West Coast style. It's painted with ground pigments and, and high glue paint. Okay, this stuff. What I would like to get you in tune to also is you're not... Well, some people do. You want to do a representation, in a, uh, like a, what do you call that thing? A replica of, of a native style bow. You want to do an actual replica of, say, a Talawa bow. And so you would, you would use that correct wood. You would, you would back it the correct way. You would paint it in that paint um, pattern. And you should also use ground pigment paints. You know, and not this. And that's what that bow in the Nature Center is. It's like a 100% authentic bow. But, you know, there's nothing to be said that if, like, some fellow was walking um, through the wilds of the, the West Coast with some of these things in his pocket that he couldn't have traded, you know, uh, with a, a native person, you know, for salmon. You know, and they would certainly have used it because it's good paint. And so we shouldn't necessarily limit ourselves. Where was I going to go with that? Okay, the paint, the actual painting procedure itself. Now I'm going to, I'm going to grab another bow, but I'm going to show you this one. If you saw the close up, there is a black line that is as straight as I can get with my shaky paws, but it's straight enough to look nice. And plus, I wouldn't want to like have a, a guide to make it perfectly straight because you do want to have that little. Um, imperfection in it so you can see that there was somebody's hand actually working on that. Now there were a few areas where like shoot you know it got wider it got onto the belly got onto the um, rawhide and it distracted your eye didn't look good enough and so I simply took a sanding block I forgot what I used 220 or something like that and you can clean up edges with a sanding block 
suppose you're painting um, a tri or a diamond here and it goes out. Wet your thumb and really quickly just flick it back in, lifting it up so you're not getting it on the other side. Um, if you are going to have a board around here, I'm talking about fixing, fixing um, mistakes here. If this is going to be a black border, or let's say a copper border, and I did it on this one. A copper border, which I do first, and then black interior, if the copper gets kind of inside, no worries, because the black will cover it. And actually, the easiest part of painting is if you have, like, this field here, and you want to go to an edge, that's the easiest part. I do most of it, and then I kind of do this, adjusting the paintbrush, so it gets, it's easy, it's easy. Um... There was something I was going to mention about this. Oh, colors. You know, you go and you think white, black, a nice red. But don't, don't overlook the odd ones. Because in this case, the tallow bow that uh, was represented in the bo traditional Boyer's Bibles, there was orange. There was orange. Now I did switch out this, this red. It wasn't red, they had a green and they had a black, which would have meant that this entire surface of rawhide would have been covered with paint. And I didn't have a good green, so I went with red. You know, it happens, and I didn't feel like mixing, because if I run out um, halfway, then I have to remix it, and the chances of getting it exact or slim, so I went with red. Red works. And so I modified it. I wound up the orange field, which I did the black first, then I did the orange, and then I did the red. And again, if I made a mistake in any part of this, especially like if it was that black, that red could have covered over it, or I could have just scraped it off. Um, you know, so you can correct your mistakes. Now, a technique, as far as, you know, the order of operations, what you paint first and stuff like that, I'll get into that, why not? Okay, the first thing, dyes. If I'm going to do dyes, I will do dyes first. This is a dye, um, mass, Arrow Master or something. It's the Arrow Cresting dye that Mike Yancey sells. And this is a dye right here. The red is a paint. But I'll always do the dyeing first. Um, and by the way, if you're going to use a finish, be careful. Test on a small piece because some finishes will make run, dyes run. Helmsman Spar Urethane. Varnish Get stuck. does not make the arrow cresting dies that Mike Yancey sells run. That's good. The ultimate floor finish by Minwax, it, would, it ruins them. But Minwax, um, spar urethane varnish, doesn't make the dies run. Order of operations. I would take, let's take this, these triangles right here. I did this black strip first. Um, if you're not confident, you know, you have to be confident to do that. You could have done those, the blue triangles first. But I did the black stripe first. Then I did the blue triangles first. After marking them with that and kind of adjusting it, cleaned it off with a, a sponge, any extra pencil lines if I had to adjust them. Then I did the black lines the border them and then the white spots. And believe it or not, I tried to use black spots where those white spots were. Didn't like them, so I just put white over the black. I didn't erase them, I didn't remove them, just white went right over the black. In the case of diamonds, now I'm right-handed, and so I would do it in four steps. You don't want to have fresh paint and then get your hand on it and smear it. So I do line, line. And I'm, you notice I'm going in one direction, so I'm getting used to that. This side, this side, this side, this side, this side this side, this side, this side. So I don't have to go from June, June, or June, 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 June. It's easier if you're doing it somewhat like in order production line style. One direction, you train your hand in that. I'm not going over um, anything with my hand. I'm not risking that because I'm, I'm down range. I'm downhill from it. And that, this stuff dries so fast you can basically just Oh, then start on the other side as soon as I was thinking of flipping it, but no. Then it gets tricky for me. Then I have, this is my, this is my first line doing the other way. Or whatever, you know, you do it so you're not going to go over it with your hand. 
Um, and a lot of it is confidence. Just following that pencil line. A fresh paint line, say that these outlines were the first thing I did. It's easy if I just completely screw it up, wet paper towel, rub it off, and then go on to the next one, letting it that surface dry before you do it. Then following it up with the black. It's just that simple. Uh, what else? Brushes. I have a bunch of brushes here, but it's funny. Here's a cheap brush that I use for dyes. If you paint, use a brush for a dye, and then you dip it in, if you use black, black dye, and then you let it dry and you dip this in the red dye, it's going to blend. So make sure um, your brushes, the cheap, just cheap ones, you know, for dyeing, because it's not that critical. Um, you have a brush for each color. And then these things, you know, I go out and spend like a decent amount of money, like $11 a piece for some of these things, but it's funny that my favorite line brush is actually this ancient one um, that I've had forever. This is my favorite line brush. In a painting technique, you know, depending on how far you push down, um, that will determine how wide the line is, so you have to be careful. You have to make sure you didn't caffeinate yourself too much. I have, let's see here, where is it? I had, there it is. And just a little bit of water in there so you can like get water on your brush. Blop a paint there and I was using my scissors just to kind of block it up so the water didn't run in there. And it's very crucial that you get the, the paint to the right consistency. You want it to flow but you don't want it to be a wash. And so that takes a bit of experience. And you know, if you've ever had drafting, you know how you rotate your pencil while you're drawing a line so it stays sharp? Same thing with this, is when I, whenever I'm touching water or paint, I'm spinning this brush, and that will keep that point sharp. If you were just to like go like this without spinning it, you're gonna have lines that are like this. But by spinning it into the paint, it's gonna maintain a nice line. Oh, let's see here. I think that's about it. I'm going to feature. Now, you, you've seen this one before, and you see the difference in sheen. It's just nice. This is a matte. The Helmsman Spar Urethane semi, semi matte, semi gloss, something like that. I don't want it glaringly shiny. Don't also want it super dull. Well, this one. I'm going to take the handle off of it. I haven't hit this thing. It's, it's still drying thoroughly before I get to spar urethane. And because I have copper right there, oh, tricky, a copper bead. In the coppery, it, as close to copper color lacing on this as possible. Um, oh, on this one also, man, I hope you can see it. It grades in. This is, I mean, there's not a flat section on its center. This is round. This is round. Probably a 20 inch diameter um, section. I don't know what the width of this is or the thickness of that. I'd say maybe 3 sixteenths or an eighth, something like that. Somebody asked me about it earlier. And then I made the tip a quarter inch longer. I wanted to exaggerate the length of that tip. And what do you see? What do you see? Sinew on the tip. It's going to make it harder. You might not be able to take that slip loop and slide it up. That might doom this bow to being tied every time you brace it, but trust me that once you get used to tying on your string, um, there's the string tires out there, and, and you will back me up on this. It's, it's just as pleasant to string a bow by tying the string as it is um, sliding a loop. In fact, I think it's easier because I don't know. You don't have to adjust it. You don't have to then pop it off and twist the string to get the brace height right. You just get the brace height um, correct each time. Correct. Probably within a half an inch. You know, there are these people. They get they have those stops on the string so the arrow cannot slide up and down. They've got a mark or a shelf right here. And it's adjusted, like in the case of a compound bow. 28.732 set like pi, you know, how many digits it goes out exactly. Well, you know, in reality, you can admit it, like, when you go deer hunting, what is the range of the kill, usually? It's 
sometimes eight yards, sometimes 12, maybe sometimes 15. Do you really need to have the brace uh, within a fraction, you know, of a millimeter each time to have that accuracy to within 20 yards? No. And as far as comfort level, if you get over having to have everything so precise, it doesn't bother, it doesn't bother me. I could shoot a bow with three and a half inch brace. I could shoot one of these with five and a half. It doesn't make a, a bit of difference. The only difference it makes is if it hits your hand. Um, that hurts. But that is that. I'm gonna leave it at that. I think I've covered everything in like greater detail than I needed to. Oh, one last thing. I was talking and I got interrupted by myself. Round and then the light. I don't know if you can see it. Then it goes in, it's flat right here. Flat on this side and there's a sharp edge right there. And then that sharp edge ends and then it kind of kicks up a little bit. So this is like the very newest reincarnation of my PBs and I think this one's going to stick. It took me 10 years to get to this point, um, but I got it. I like it. This is one step earlier, which is a beautiful bow. In fact, you can adjust how heavy the bow can be by the cross section. Would I take this style with that rounded back and then this little keel here, would I get this up to 60 pounds? Nah. This is this would not be a 60 pound ball. Could I get a 60 pound ball out of this cross section? Yeah, easily. Um, so you can adjust it by that. It's all a matter of taste. It's all a matter of taste. Beautiful ball. Beautiful ball. <sighs> Good coffee.